This weekend, a little more on waiting. And we're almost there. We're almost to Christmas. It's coming up on Saturday. Friday night is our uh, Christmas Eve uh, pair of services, 4 o'clock and then 11 o'clock at night. And please join us. We're going to have the 4 o'clock also available as an online offering. Tonight, this is the 19th, tonight there's another service and that's called the longest night. It's not actually the longest night. That's in a, another night or two. But an acknowledgement that this is a time of grief for a lot of people. This is a time of hardship for a lot of people. Broken hearts surround Christmas just as much as the joy that everyone keeps singing about. So let's acknowledge that uh, tonight. And that will be available at 6. Welcome to Community Church. So glad you have decided to join in for worship today. So glad you've decided to share your Christmas, even in this way. It doesn't feel like we're quite so endangered and close to each other if we're online. But we are connected. Connected by worship. Connected by Jesus Christ who makes us one. Praise God. Praise God. So, since we are together, I want to remind you, we have a website. It is communitychurchumc.org. And you can go there and learn what's going on, little messages. You can learn about our new incoming pastor who will be replacing me starting in January, um, whose name is Robert Blanchard. And learn a little bit about Robert and you can learn about how to give and support the ministries of Community Church. I'm excited about all the things you can do online. I'm excited to have you with us. No matter who you are, you are precious and you are valued and glad you are here. And now, let's sing together. Chelsea, stay, oh, 
Pray with me. Lord, holy God, so often we find that life is not living up to our expectations. Lord, forgive us because we realize that our lives aren't always up to your expectations either. And that's, that's not your fault. That's our fault all of us together, making a world that is not living up to what it was designed for, joy and vibrancy, life, community. Lord, forgive us, we pray, and prepare us for a new beginning. And we pray this Christmas might be for us a new beginning, a thing we've been waiting for, a thing we are ready for, or not. Begin it in us, we pray, a renewal, a completion, a new time, a new possibility. And we pray for all those who are sick this time of year, who are at home, who are grieving the loss of a loved one who's not with us this season. We pray this season that you care for those who are cold today, who are outside, who have no home. We pray for those who are in the hospital and don't know if they can make it home or if they can make it for those who are alone for the first time or for the umpteenth time alone at this season for those who are overwhelmed we pray Holy Spirit surround us guide us make us be the people who live in the world that you intended to create that we failing at. In all our prayers, pray for our church that we will be a witness to your love, to your truth, to your kindness, to 
all the people in our community, our neighbors, our families, our friends. And we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's time for the kids. Listen up. Gather around. Good morning, community kids. I have two gifts here that I want to show you. And when I show them to you, I want you to yell out which one you'd rather see under your tree this Christmas morning. Okay, here's the first one. Ooh, now that is a pretty gift. Oh. Now here's gift number two. Ooh, this one looks like it's been opened already. Oh, that doesn't look very good. Thanks. Okay, which one do you want? I know which one I'd choose. I think most people wouldn't be very excited about this. And maybe that's why so many people missed out on God's gift of Jesus, because Jesus certainly didn't come wrapped in fancy wrapping. Jesus' mother was a young teenager. His earthly father was poor. He was just a carpenter. He was born in a nothing kind of place. He certainly didn't come as a very pretty package. Despite the wrapping that Jesus came in, Jesus is the best gift the world has ever known. It also reminds us that not everybody comes in a pretty package. See, some people show up in our lives who are stinky and dirty and not very smart and maybe have a different skin color than we do, or they might believe or think different than we do. Maybe they talk different than we do. And those same people could be our greatest gift. So I think the Christmas story reminds us not to forget about the people in our lives that may, maybe they be, are wrapped up like this instead of this. Have a very Merry Christmas. No, how a rose have blown. ago I preached to you from um, near the middle of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 
And now I, I want to talk about something toward the beginning of the chapter, right after the hello. Um, and tonight I'm going to talk about something later in the chapter, starting at verse 18. But right now I'm going to start at verse 4. And I just want you to hear the scripture and listen up for what God might be saying to you. Paul says this, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and in knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you're not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. My mom's great grandpa or something like that, was named Cornelius Griffiths, and he was a pastor, and he was in Bristol in England, and we have somewhere the newspaper report about his farewell sermon when he retired from the Baptist church that he had founded many years before that. And in that sermon, he talked about himself as Moses. Well, I haven't been here long enough to talk about myself as Moses. I've only been here four and a half years. And as I uh, trail off into a sunset, I, I have less authority than that. And I would never claim the Moses mantle. That's a dangerous thing to pick up to say, I am the one leading you on God's behalf. No, as much as a pastor is a leader, a pastor is also a listener. And though I seem to speak always on Sunday mornings, yet during the week I want to listen to what people have to say, and sometimes I have to, I have to pay attention and, and say, say that again, and I notice someone just looking as though they're thinking about saying something, and I have to call on them and say, hey, what was that you were thinking of saying? And that way I get to listen for God's wisdom that comes through so many voices, so many people, so many ways, so many conversations, and Serving as pastor of Community Church has been a great joy for all these four and a half years, not without occasional frustrations, not without difficulties at times, not without disagreements. Nothing we couldn't get through. And me leaving, mercifully, is also nothing we can't get through. I'm going to be taking care of Tamara on a full-time basis. It already feels like I take care of Tamara on a full-time basis. But then I won't have to also be doing church things. So that's a plus. I just wanted to give you that framework. And remind you that though I can't talk about myself like Moses, I can talk a little bit like Paul. And these words that he wrote at the beginning of 1 Corinthians as he said hello to people that he had met before, people whose church he had actually started, that he can, he can talk to them with great thanksgiving. And that is such a good thing. When I first showed up as pastor for the first time, 
at a little church called Arden, north of Berrien Springs in the country. I went on my predecessor's last Sunday because he asked me to. I, unfortunately, Robert isn't able to be with us uh, this morning for worship because he has responsibilities still. But I didn't have those Sunday morning responsibilities because it was my first church. And I heard my predecessor, Jess Schwobel, tell the congregation what a poor job they had been doing at attending church. And I thought to myself, if this is the kind of sermon they've been hearing, then it's no wonder that they've been doing a poor job. But they did come to honor you and say goodbye to you and share love with you one last time. And the love that a congregation gives to their pastor is a great thing and a gift and a joy and thank you. This congregation has given us so much love. But the last thing I would ever want to do is to harangue you, especially now as we approach the end, because this is my last Sunday working here. Next Sunday, uh, Doug will be bringing the message, and that'll be the day after Christmas. But I will be here for Christmas Eve, but I couldn't really make Christmas Eve my sort of farewell message, so that's right now. So the first thing Paul said was, I give thanks to my God always for you. Because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus and what grace has been given. You have been a people who love one another. Now we can complain, we can look back on, on the past and, and say, oh, there used to be umpteen kids and there used to be a big choir and it used to be a bell choir and used to be this and used to be that. And wasn't it great when we had a pastor stick around for 14 years and, and wasn't, well, sure. All those things are great. Ah, stop grumbling. You're fine. We have so much joy in the congregation. Every church in America right now, no matter how brave they are, no matter how foolish, no matter how they have decided to deal with the, uh, the pandemic, all of them are facing the fact that this is 2021. And the churches we used to admire because they were so huge are all going through precipitous decline in attendance and giving and all those things. And this is a hard time to be a church, isn't it? But it's a great time to rediscover ourselves, to find out that in fact the grace of God has been given to us all through this time. That the grace of God has not let go of us, but has provided us Newer leaders, stronger leaders, people who organize, people who visit the sick and shut in, has brought to us refocusing on our ministry, on our community, on doing things that make a difference. And that is irreplaceable. That is the grace of God at work among us. And that is incredible. In every way, as he says, you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind. You know, I, I was asked in the interview, uh, interview, introductory meeting, uh, when I was first brought here, I was asked by that, Staff Parish Relations Committee back then. So are you more of a storytelling pastor or more of a teaching pastor? And I said, I, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I tell stories. But I knew the truth. And Tamara said, oh, he's more of a teacher. And I have enjoyed teaching as much as I can here. I have enjoyed trying to put together messages for you 
that are informational, educational, and inspiring, I hope. But mostly, my thing I have wanted to teach you is to follow Christ, to follow Christ more completely, more radically, more generously, more fully. And then within that, to say, I want to learn more. I'm not going to assume that what I learned in Sunday school a long time ago is all of the message I needed. I'm going to assume that there is always more to learn because we're talking about God here, not about you know, ourselves. And so because there is always more to learn and more insight available, I have tried to bring you what insight I can. And I don't want to pretend that I have all the insight. I am not a prophet of God. I am not able to speak with that kind of authority. But you, I hope, have had this opportunity, especially if you've been taking part in worship, either here online or in person or a little bit of both, to grow in knowledge. And one of the weird things I've noticed about preaching and what it does in the life of a congregation is that an in every church, when a pastor like me keeps using language to talk about our faith, that language starts working its way into your language. You keep hearing it and it becomes part of you. And that, I think, is one of the profound ways that the Holy Spirit keeps shaping our speech and shaping our knowledge, and shaping our minds, and shaping our priorities. And some of the things that you might have been thinking along the way, some of the things you might have believed along the way, now you would call them into question. And you would try to be more faithful. And you have been ever so faithful. And you have learned from every pastor before me as you have learned, I hope, from me. And you will learn more and more from Robert who follows me. You will learn more and more from every pastor who follows uh, after Robert. And the reason is that the Holy Spirit is our real teacher and keeps after us and keeps talking to us. So the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you. You have done things. I mean, the parsonage, or shall I say project, the parsonage project of letting another organization use it was an act of, of spiritual openness, of radical generosity that wasn't even my idea. It was your idea. Because you said to yourselves, how can we do the best we can for the community, for our neighbors, whoever they are? How can we do the best with what we have? And that was your answer. That was your answer. We can do this. We can give this house to ministry as we've given it to pastors for them to do ministry. That generosity continues, and you have been a blessing. As Paul says, he will strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is language of end of the world sort of stuff. The day of the Lord is usually final judgment when New Testament writers like Paul say it and they say on that day on that day all these things will happen and it's a promise and it's a curse as well it's a it's a opportunity and a challenge and so he says you've been strengthened to the end you will be strengthened to the end 
so that you may be blameless on the day of the Lord. So, what would it take for you to be strengthened to the end? And what would it mean for you to be blameless at the end? So listen to that question again. What would it take for you to be blameless at the end? For God to look at your life when you are done with this life, at your end, and to say, I am not holding anything against you. What would it be to live in such a way that you could say that for yourself? You know, I I have been a person for a long time. I have been a fool for a lot of that time. I have been selfish. I have been belligerent. I have been over opinionated. As long as I can remember. In one way or another. And every time I notice those things welling up inside myself. I try to call a halt. Sometimes I just need something to eat get over the hangries. But sometimes I need time to reflect and pray. I need time to go into study of scripture some more. I need time to worship. I need time. But I also need a refocusing. I need to remember, okay, how can I evaluate what I've just been saying? How can I decide whether I'm being fair or unfair, whether I'm being decent, whether I'm paying attention to what God wants or not. And when I open up and pause and listen to myself and then put that up against what I know God wants of me, well, then I am strengthened. I become more what I need to become. I am reminded. You know, Paul was talking, though he loved them and said these good things about them. He was talking to a church that was full of division. Heck, they had Republicans and they had Democrats. They had, they had people who listened to some commentator over here, to be unnamed, and people who listened to some commentator over here, and then they had a swarming mass of people in the middle who didn't know what to do with all that conflict, who tried to love one another. I think it was those to whom he was speaking. So that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want the day of the Lord Jesus Christ to be every day, to be today. And then he says, God is faithful. In a, in a time when you are changing pastors, it's, a, it's probably a good opportunity to remember that pastors ain't all that. They aren't really all that important. They are what they are, and they try to do all they can do to lead the church in good directions. They try very hard to do right, to speak truth, but we all fade away. We all become less effective at some point in our careers. We all make mistakes and head down wrong paths. We say things wrong and offend somebody. It happens to all of us, it's happened to me. But Paul says, You know, even though pastors come and pastors go and some are great and some can preach and some can visit and some can do neither and some can do both and some can lead and administer and some just know how to share love like mad. The thing that matters, God is faithful. God is faithful. And though pastors come and pastors go, 
God is faithful. Though congregations come and congregations go, though generations die and generations are born, God is faithful. In all of it, God is the one we can turn to and know there is faith, there is hope, there is purpose, and there is a calling, and the calling does not quit. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You have been called. And if you have been called, and if you have been called into the church, that is, community United Methodist Church, here you are. You are still called. If you have been called into doing ministry here, service here, you know, ministry just means service, right? If you have been called to serve in any way while you are here, then I want you to know that call remains. That faithfulness of God remains. The joy of seeing one another on a Sunday morning remains. That's great, isn't it? That is so great. In fact, right at this moment, I want to encourage you. On the other side of Christmas, well, there's the 26th when Doug is preaching. And then January 2nd, I want to invite you to come for a special service. I won't be here, and I won't be here the 26th. But I want to invite you to come to a special service that is a service of covenant renewal. And Sandy Harriman, Reverend Sandy Harriman, will be leading that service and bringing to you a service for saying to ourselves and to God, I'm starting again. I'm starting again as we begin the new year. It's a traditional time for us to have this service and to remind ourselves that we are just as committed today as we were when we first began. In fact, I hope you can say that you are more committed today than you were years ago. Come to the Lord and serve him. That is what I intend to do. I intend to serve the Lord by serving my wife. I intend to serve the Lord in the future by serving a church again sometime in the future. But it may not be very soon. And that would be good. How has the Lord called you to serve? How has the Lord called you to be faithful? What has the Lord asked of you today? Here, at the end of a year, at the end of my little term here, what is the Lord asking of you? Let's bring it to the Lord with gladness. Amen. People get ready, there's a train coming. You don't need no baggage, you just get on board. All you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. Don't need no ticket, you just thank the Lord. People get ready for the train to Jordan Picking up passengers coast to coast Faith is the key, open the borders of boredom There's hope for all among those who love the most Sinner who 
would hurt all mankind just to save his own. Have pity on those whose chances grow thinner, for there's no hiding place against the kingdom's throne. So people get ready, there's a train coming. You don't need no baggage. Get on board. All you need is faith to hear the diesel humming. Don't need no ticket, you just thank the Lord. Friends, may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and bless you and keep you, now and forever. Amen.